Section 28 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 9, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 8, Part 2. Among the papers at the Hotel de Subis are letters from various ecclesiastics to the Queen's friend, La Mer Priolo, tracing the progress of their journey to the Baths of Bourbon, in which they made stages from one convent to another. The nature of this correspondence makes it overloaded with the details of Catholic observances, which afford little satisfaction to those interested in historical research. Here and there, however, are a few biographical notices. The Queen was a little overpowered by the odor of the pastilles burnt at the high mass, but she told the writer, she was quite ashamed of this weakness, which had not thus affected her for a long time. The tender and devoted affection of Mary Beatrice for her unfortunate consort is simply and touchingly manifested in a letter which she addressed on the 20th of April to her friend, Madame Priolo, after they had accomplished their long weary journey to the baths of Bourbon. The king was better, and her heart overflows with thankfulness to God, and an unwanted strain of cheerfulness pervades her paper. Bourbon, 20th of April. At last, my dear mother, she says, we arrived at this place on the 14th day after our departure from Saint-Germain without any accident. God be thanked, the king is better. He has a little gout, which is now gone. His hand and knee are gaining strength. He eats and sleeps well, and I hope that we shall bring him back in perfect health. If God should grant us this mercy, instead of complaining of the journey, which I have assuredly found very long and uncomfortable, I shall call it the most agreeable, and the happiest I have made in all my life. With regard to myself, too, I ought not to complain, for I am so well that I am astonished at it. Assist me, my dear mother, in rendering thanks to God for his mercy, in sustaining me in the various states in which it has pleased him to place me, and beseech him to grant me the grace to be more faithful and grateful to him. The British ambassador had accurate information, meantime, of the minutest particulars relating to the proceedings of Mary Beatrice and her suffering lord. In a dispatch dated April 20th, he says, the late king has the gout at Bourbon, so cannot drink the waters. Mary Beatrice, in her letter of the same date, mentions her visits to the nuns of Montargis and other religious communities, being aware that such matters would prove of greater interest to her friends at Chalot than details of the company whom she met at the Baths of Bourbon or the business of the great world. I have been much pleased with our sisters of Montargis, and above all, with the good mother, with whom I appear to be well acquainted, from the love I bear to her sister, whom she much resembles. They have also a de Posse, who appears to have some merit. These of Nevers gave me your dear letter. There was such a crowd when I received it, that I was not able to look it over, as I could have wished, but the little I saw pleased me much. Our poor sisters of Moulin I have not seen, because we were taken by another road, at which I was much vexed. But if it please God, before I quit this place, I will go one day to see them express. Today they have sent their confessor to signify their chagrin at not having seen me. From an inedited letter of the superior, in the archives à Royaume de France, it appears that Mary Beatrice and her consort visited that convent the day before the festival of the Holy Trinity. The queen edified all the religious by the humility with which she followed the processions of that festival on foot. Without parasol, squire or train bearer, with a taper in her hand, the angelic modesty of her countenance made her the admiration of all beholders. The king was unable to walk without the supporting arm of his faithful consort, but he viewed the procession from a balcony. We have had five queens here, says the superior of Moulin, whom I remember very well, but not one comparable to this. Every one is equally charmed and edified with her. From this correspondence, it appears that the waters and baths of Bourbon freed King James's arm from the rheumatic gout and enabled him to walk and speak with less difficulty, instances of amendment which prove how deeply he had been afflicted. The personal attentions of the queen to her suffering husband are mentioned with admiration by the writers of the numerous packets of letters 
from which we have gleaned this intelligence. Such instances of humanity and affectionate duty can be appreciated by everyone. Those who would turn away with disgust from the processions and trifling observances with which these letters are loaded can appreciate the fond wife and devoted nurse. The effect of the waters of bourbon was so beneficial to King James that, contrary to all expectation, he was able to commence his journey to Saint-Germain on the 4th of June. The queen, on her return from the baths of bourbon, visited the convent of nuns in the town called La Charite on the Lorry. She could not help, as she told her ladies afterwards, observing the extreme poverty of the nuns. They told her that this was occasioned by robbers who often came and pillaged them of all that they possessed, but of late they had kept a rifle always loaded in order to fire if the bandits came. Which, indeed, the queen added, that she had noticed and had remarked to herself that it was strange to see such a weapon in a cell of nuns. It does not appear whether the poor ladies ever fired the rifle. Perhaps it was merely hung up in terrorem. The queen writes from Montargis the following cheering account of King James's health. We are now within three days' journey of Paris in good health, thank God. The king gains strength every day, and they assure us that, after a few days of rest, he will find himself much better than he has yet done. He has a very good appearance. He eats well and sleeps very well. He walks much better and has begun to write. It is a great change for the better. I am persuaded that the prayers of Chalot and of almost all of our holy institutions have contributed more to it than the waters. God be praised for it forever. The queen in her postscript adds, I must not forget to tell you that it will be impossible to stop at Chalot at all. For the Tuesday, the last day of our journey, we have arranged to go straight by Desson to Saint-Germain, having, as you may believe, some impatience to embrace my dear children. During her anxious attendance on her sick consort at Bourbon, Mary Beatrice, from time to time, sent messengers to Saint-Germain to inquire after the health and welfare of her children, who remained there under the care of the Duke of Perth and the Countess of Middleton. Very constant and dutiful had the prince and his little sister been in their correspondence with their royal parents at this period of unwanted separation. A packet of their simple little letters to the queen is still preserved, among more important documents of the exiled stewards, in the Archives au Royaume de France, in Paris, containing interesting evidence of the strong ties of natural affection, by which the hearts of this unfortunate family were entwined together. Mary Beatrice and James arrived at Saint-Germain, in time for the celebration of the birthday fetes of their son and daughter. The prince completed his thirteenth year on the 10th of June, and the princess her ninth on the 28th of the same month. Visits of congratulation were paid by the King of France and all the members of the royal family to the King and Queen on their return from Bourbon. Though Louis the Fourteenth had been compelled to recognize William the Third as King of Great Britain, he continued to treat the deposed King and Queen with the same punctilious attention to all the ceremonials of state as if they had retained their regality. When the young Duke of Anjou, his grandson, was declared King of Spain, he sent his first equerry to announce the fact to them, and he treated the new monarch precisely with the same honors as he did King James, taking care to avoid the slightest misunderstanding by never allowing them to meet in his presence, as he considered each entitled to the honor of a fautil on his right hand, which it was impossible both could have at the same time. The young king of Spain visited James and his queen at Saint-Germain, and they returned his visits at Versailles. The improvement in the health of her beloved consort during their late visit at Bourbon, which had filled the heart of Mary Beatrice with false hopes of his ultimate recovery, was but of a temporary duration. The British ambassador, who kept, through his spies at Saint-Germain, a close watch on the symptoms of his deposed sovereign, gives the following account of his state in a dispatch dated June 15th. King James is so decayed in his senses that he takes care of nothing, all things going direct to the queen. They were both yesterday at Versailles to wait on the king, but they did not come till after five, so that I was gone. The decay of King James's senses, of which his former liegeman speaks, was a failure of his physical powers, 
which had, as before noticed, been brought too early into action. Edward the Black Prince, John of Gaunt, Henry the Fourth, and Henry the Seventh, men of far greater natural talents than James the Second, all died in a pitiable state of mental atrophy, prematurely worn out, the victims of their precocious exertions. In addition to this cause, James had been heavily visited in the last fourteen years of his life with a burden of sorrow such as few princes have been doomed to bear. Calumniated, betrayed, and driven from his throne into exile and poverty by his beloved and fondly cherished daughters, the heart of the modern leer of British history had, of course, been wrung with pangs no less bitter than those which that great master of the human heart, Shakespeare, has portrayed, goading the outraged king and father to madness. But James bore his wrongs with the patience of a Christian, and instead of raving of foul, unnatural hags, and invoking the vengeance of heaven on one or both of them, like the hero of the tragedy, he besought daily of God to pardon them. He was encouraged in his placable feelings by his consort, for Mary Beatrice, deeply as she had been injured by her stepdaughters and their husbands, never spoke an angry word of either, but was accustomed to check her ladies if they began to inveigh against them. As we cannot speak of them with praise, she would say, we will not make them a subject of discourse, since it only causes irritation and gives rise to feelings that cannot be pleasing to God. Let us rather look closely to ourselves and endeavor to avoid those faults which we see in others. Although a few fond superstitions, the result of education and association with her conventual friends, now and then peep out in the letters of Mary Beatrice, the fervency and depth of her piety and love of God, her patience and resignation under all her trials and afflictions, and her charitable forbearance, from reviling those who had so cruelly injured and calumniated her, prove her to be a sincere Christian. In one of her letters to her friend, Angelique Priolo, she says that she supplicates the God of all consolation to fill her heart with his holy love, and then to do what he would with her. For I believe, continues she, that a heart full of divine love is at peace and content in every kind of state, and cannot be otherwise than well. This is the only thing I would pray you ask for me, my dear mother. It is the sole thing needful, without which one cannot be happy, either in this world or in the other, and with which all that the world calls misfortunes and disgrace cannot render one miserable. I believe this as firmly as if I had experienced it myself, although in truth I have never felt an approach to it. For instead of doing all for love, I do all perforce. God knows it, and you may comprehend it well, and therefore I am sure, my dear mother, that you will pity me and pray for me. King James's sands of life were now ebbing fast. The Earl of Manchester, in a dispatch dated July 13th, says, The late king was taken with another fit of apoplexy, and it was thought he would not have lived half an hour. His eyes were fixed, and I heard yesterday he was ill again. He is so ill decayed that by every post you may expect to hear of his death. The skill of Fagon, who remained in constant attendance, and the tender care of his conjugal nurse, assisted the naturally strong constitution of James to make a second rally. He crept out once more, on fine sunny days, in the parterre, supported by the arm of his royal helpmate, accompanied by their children, and attended by the faithful adherents who formed their little court. Sometimes his majesty felt strong enough to extend his walk as far as the terrace of Saint-Germain, which, with its forest background and rich prospect over the valley of the Seine, bore a tantalizing resemblance to the unforgotten scenery of Richmond Hill and the Thames, with the heights of Windsor in the distance. The eyes of Mary Beatrice were at times, perhaps suffused with unbidden tears, at the remembrances they recalled. But the thoughts, the hopes, the desires of the dying king, her husband, were fixed on brighter realms. He who had learned to thank God for having deprived him of three crowns, that he might lead him through the chastening paths of sorrow to a heavenly inheritance, regarded the kingdoms of this world and their glories, with the eye of one who stands on the narrow verge between time and eternity. The Terrace of Saint-Germain was a public promenade, and many of the English who visited France after the Peace of Ryswick incurred the risk of being treated as Jacobites 
on their return home by resorting thither. Some, doubtless, sought that prohibited spot to gratify a sort of lingering affection for James and his queen, which they dared not acknowledge even to themselves, but the greater number came for the indulgence of their idle curiosity to see the exiled court. Few even of the latter class, however, except the hireling spies of the Dutch cabinet, who were always loitering in the crowd, could behold without feelings allied to sympathy, the wasted form of him who had been their king, bowed earthward with sorrow rather than with years, his feeble steps supported by his pale anxious consort, their once beautiful queen, her eyes bent with fond solicitude on his face, or turned with appealing glances from him to any of their former subjects whom she recognized, and then with mute eloquence directing their attention to her son. It was not every one who could resist her silent pleading, and it is noticed by Lord Manchester that the hopes of the Jacobites of Saint-Germain of the restoration of the royal family were never more sanguine than at that period when everything in the shape of business was transacted by the queen. The tender solicitude of Mary Beatrice for her children led her to bestow much of her personal attention on them when they were ill. On one occasion, when they were both confined to their chambers with severe colds, she describes herself as going from one to the other all day long. The early deaths of her three elder children rendered her naturally apprehensive lest these beloved ones should also be snatched away. Yet her maternal hopes were so confidently fixed on her son that one day, when he was so seriously ill that apprehensions were entertained for his life, she said, God who has given him to me will, I hope, preserve him to me. I doubt not that he will rule one day on the throne of his fathers. God can never permit the legitimate line of princes to fail. It was the personal influence of the woman, a queen now only in name, that gave vitality to the Stuart cause, at a time when every passing day brought King James nearer to the verge of the tomb. It was her impassioned pleading that enlisting the Dauphin and his generous son, the Duke of Burgundy, and Madame de Maintenon on her side, obtained from Louis the Fourteenth the solemn promise of recognizing her son's claim to the style and title of King of England, when his father should be no more. King James continued to linger through the summer, and was occasionally strong enough to mount his horse. Mary Beatrice began to flatter herself with hopes of his recovery, and weary as he was of the turmoil of the world, there were yet strong ties to bind him to an existence that was endeared by the affection of a partner who, crushed as she was with sorrow, sickness, and infirmity, continued, after a union of nearly eight and twenty years, to love him with the same passionate fondness as in the first years of their marriage. It was hard to part with her and their children, the lovely, promising, and dutiful children of his old age, whom nature had apparently so well qualified to adorn that station of which his rash and ill-advised proceedings had been the means of depriving them. A political crisis of great importance appeared to be at hand. The days of his rival, William the Third, were numbered as well as his own. Both were laboring under incurable maladies. The race of life, even then, was closely matched between them, and if James ever desired a lengthened existence, it was that, for the sake of his son, he might survive William, fancying, fond delusion, that his daughter Anne would not dare to contest the throne with him. The clear-sighted diplomatist who represented William at the court of France, feeling the importance of a close attention to the chances in a game that was arriving at so nice a point, kept too keen a watch on the waning light of his old master's lamp of life to be deceived by its occasional flashes. In his dispatch of the 31st of August, 1701, he says, The late king hopes still to go to Fontainebleau, but I know this court will prevent it, because he might very likely die there, which would be inconvenient. The event alluded to in these humane terms appears to have been hastened by a reoccurrence of the same incident, which caused King James's first severe stroke of apoplexy in the preceding spring. On Friday, September 2nd, while he was at Mass in the Chapel Royal, the choir unfortunately sung the fatal anthem again. Lord, remember what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach etc. The same agonizing chord was touched, as on the former occasion, with a similar effect. He sank into the arms of the queen in a swoon, and was carried from the chapel into his chamber in a state of insensibility. 
after a time suspended animation was restored but the fit returned upon him with greater violence a most afflicting sight says the continuator of his memoirs for his most disconsolate queen into whose arms he fell the second time mary beatrice had acquired sufficient firmness in the path of duty to be able to control her own agonies on this occasion for the sake of the beloved object of her solicitude she had inherited from her mother the qualifications of a skilful nurse and her queenly rank had never elevated her above the practical duties of the conjugal character she could not deceive herself as to the mournful truth which the looks of all around her proclaimed and her own sad heart assured her that the dreaded moment of separation between them was at hand contrary however to all expectation nature made another rally her husband recovered from his long death-like swoon and all the following day appeared better but he looking death steadily in the face sent for his confessor on the sunday morning and had just finished his general confession when he was seized with another fit which lasted so long that every one believed him to be dead his teeth being forced open a frightful hemorrhage of blood took place a reoccurrence for the third time only in a more aggravated form of the symptoms of sanguineous apoplexy with which he was threatened when with the army at salisbury and which so effectually fought the battles of his foes against him by precluding him from the possibility of either bodily or mental exertion the distress and terror of the queen nearly overpowered her on this occasion but she struggled with the weakness of her sex and refused to leave her suffering husband in his extremity james himself was calm and composed and as soon as the hemorrhage could be stopped expressed a wish to receive the last rites of his church but said he would see his children first and sent for his son the young prince when he entered the chamber and saw the pale death-like countenance of his father and the bed all covered with blood gave way to a passionate burst of grief in which every one else joined except the dying king who appeared perfectly serene when the prince approached the bed he extended his arms to embrace him and addressed his last admonition to him in these impressive words which notwithstanding the weakness and exhaustion of sinking nature were uttered with a fervor and a solemnity that astonished every one i am now leaving this world which has been to me a sea of storms and tempests it being god almighty's will to wean me from it by many great afflictions serve him with all your power and never put the crown of england in competition with your eternal salvation there is no slavery like sin nor no liberty like his service if his holy providence shall think fit to seat you on the throne of your royal ancestors govern your people with justice and clemency remember kings are not made for themselves but for the good of the people set before their eyes in your own actions a pattern of all manner of virtues consider them as your children you are the child of vows and prayers behave yourself accordingly honor your mother that your days may be long and be always a kind brother to your dear sister that you may reap the blessings of concord and unity those who were about the king apprehending that the excitement of continuing to speak long and earnestly on subjects of so agitating a nature would be too much for his exhausted frame suggested that the prince had better now withdraw at which his majesty was troubled and said do not take my son away from me till i have given him my blessing at least the little princess louisa was brought to the bedside of her dying father bathed in tears to receive in her turn all that heaven had left in the power of the unfortunate james to bestow on his children by mary beatrice his paternal benediction and advice it was perhaps a harder trial for james to part with this daughter than with his son she was the child of his old age the joy of his dark and wintry years he had named her la consolatrice when he first looked upon her and she had even when in her nurse's arms manifested an extraordinary affection for him she was one of the most beautiful children in the world and her abilities were of a much higher order than those of her brother reflective and intelligent beyond her tender years her passionate sorrow showed how deeply she was touched by the sad state in which she saw her royal father and that she comprehended only too well the calamity that impended over her adieu my dear child said james after he had embraced and blessed her adieu serve your creator in the days of your youth 
consider virtue as the greatest ornament of your sex follow close the steps of that great pattern of it your mother who has been no less than myself overclouded with calumnies but time the mother of truth will i hope at last make her virtue shine as bright as the sun this noble tribute of the dying consort of mary beatrice to her moral worth doubly affecting from the circumstances under which it was spoken is the more interesting because the prediction it contained is fulfilled by the discovery and publication of documents verifying the integrity of her life and actions and exposing the baseness of the motives which animated the hireling scribblers of a party to calumniate her the observation of human life as well as the research of those writers who taking nothing on trust are at the trouble of first searching out and then investigating evidences will generally prove that railing accusations are rather indicative of the baseness of the person who made them than of want of worth in those against whom they are brought james did not confine his deathbed advice to his children he exhorted his servants and friends to forsake sin and lead holy and christian lives and tried to persuade his principal minister of state the earl of middleton to embrace the doctrines of the church of rome after he had received the last sacraments of that church from the cure of saint germain he told him that he wished to be buried privately in his parish church with no other monumental inscription than these words here lies james king of great britain he declared himself in perfect charity with all the world and lest his declaration that he forgave all his enemies from the bottom of his heart should be considered too general he named his son-in-law the prince of orange and the princess anne of denmark his daughter all this while the poor queen who had never quitted him for a moment being unable to support herself had sunk down upon the ground by his bedside in much greater anguish than he and with almost as little signs of life james was sensibly touched to see her in such excessive grief and seemed to suffer more on that account than any other he tried all he could to comfort her and to persuade her to resign herself to the will of god in this as in all her other trials but none had appeared to mary beatrice so hard as this and she remained inconsolable till a visible improvement taking place in the king's symptoms she began to flatter herself that his case was not desperate james passed a better night and the next day louis the fourteenth came to visit him he would not suffer his coach to drive into the court lest the noise should disturb his dying kinsman but alighted at the iron gates the same as others james received him with the same ease and composure as though nothing extraordinary were the matter louis had a long private conference with mary beatrice for whom he testified the greatest sympathy and consideration on the following sunday his majesty of france paid a second visit and the whole of that day the chamber of king james was thronged with a succession of visitors of distinction who came to harass him and the queen with complimentary marks of attention on this occasion no wonder that he sank in a state of exhaustion on the following day that his fever returned and all hopes of his recovery vanished when this last fatal change appeared the queen who was as usual by his bedside gave way to an irrepressible burst of anguish this distressed the king who said to her do not afflict yourself i am going i hope to be happy i doubt it not she replied it is not for your condition i lament but for my own and then her grief overpowering her she appeared ready to faint away which he perceiving entreated her to retire and bade those who were near him lead her to her chamber the sight of her grief was the only thing that shook the firmness with which he was passing through the dark valley of the shadow of death as soon as the queen had withdrawn james requested that the prayers for a departing soul should be read to him and for him in which he joined with unaffected devotion meantime mary beatrice having recovered herself a little was only prevented by the injunctions of her spiritual director and the consciousness that worn out as she was by grief and watching she would be unable to command her feelings from returning to her wonted station by the pillow of her dying lord but though she was not permitted to be present visibly she came softly round by the back stairs and knelt unseen in a closet behind the alcove of the bed where she could hear every word and every sigh that was uttered by that dear object of her love 
which for upwards of seven and twenty years had been the absorbing principle of her existence. In that unsuspected retreat, Mary Beatrice remained for several hours, listening with breathless anxiety to every sound and every motion in the alcove. If she heard the king cough or groan, her heart was pierced at the thought of his sufferings, and that she was no longer permitted to support and soothe him, and if all were silent, she dreaded that he had ceased to breathe. James sunk into a sort of lethargy, giving for several days little consciousness of life, except when prayers were read to him, when by the expression of his countenance and the motion of his lips, it was plain that he prayed also. Meantime, the momentous question of what should be done with regard to acknowledging the claims of the youthful son of James the Second and Mary Beatrice to the title of King of Great Britain after the decease of the deposed monarch was warmly debated in the cabinet council of Louis the Fourteenth. All but seven were opposed to a step in direct violation to the Treaty of Ryswick, and which must have the effect of involving France in a war for which she was ill prepared. Louis the Fourteenth who had committed himself by the hopes he had given to Mary Beatrice, listened in perturbed silence to the objections of his council, in which his reason acquiesced, but the Dauphin, being the last to speak, gave a strong proof of the friendship, which in his quiet way he cherished for the parents of the disinherited heir of England, for rising in some warmth, he said, It would be unworthy of the crown of France to abandon a prince of their own blood, especially one who was so near and dear to them as the son of King James, that he was, for his part, resolved to hazard not only his life, but all that was dear to him for his restoration. Then the King of France said, I am of Monsieur's opinion. And so said the Duke of Burgundy and all the princes of the blood. The following interesting particulars connected with this determination of Louis the Fourteenth were narrated by Mary Beatrice herself, and must be related in her own words. It was, said she, a miraculous interposition, in which, with a heart penetrated with a grateful sense of his goodness to us, I recognize the hand of the Most High, who was pleased to raise up for us a protector in his own good time, by disposing the heart of the greatest of kings, to take compassion on the widow and orphans of a king, whom it had pleased God to cover with afflictions here below. We can never cease to acknowledge the obligations that we owe to the king, for not only has he done all that he could for us, but he did it in a manner so heroic and touching, that even our enemies cannot help admiring him for it. He came twice to see my good king during his illness, and said and did everything with which generous feeling could inspire a noble heart for the illustrious sufferer he could not refrain from shedding tears more than once on seeing the danger of his friend. He spared neither care nor pains to procure every solace and every assistance that was considered likely to arrest the progress of the malady. At last, on the Tuesday after the king had received the viaticum for the second time, and they had no longer any hopes of him, this kind protector did me the honor of writing with his own hand a note to me, to let me know that he was coming to Saint-Germain, to tell me something that would console me. He then came to me in my chamber, where he declared to me, with a thousand marks of friendship, the most consolatory that could be, under the circumstances, that after due reflection, he had determined to recognize the Prince of Wales, my son, for the heir of the three kingdoms of Great Britain, whensoever it should please God to remove the king, and that he would then render the same honors to him as he had done to the king his father. I had previously implored this great monarch, in the presence of the king my husband, to continue the honor of his protection to my children and me, and entreated him to be to us in the place of a father. I made him all the acknowledgments in my power, and he told me that, I could impart these tidings to the king my husband, when and how I thought best. I entreated him to be the bearer of them himself. Louis, being desirous of doing everything that was likely to alleviate her affliction, proceeded with her to King James's chamber. Life was so far spent with that prince, that he was not aware of the entrance of his august visitor, and when Louis inquired after his health, he made no answer, for he neither saw nor heard him. When one of his attendants roused him from the drowsy stupor in which he lay, to tell him that the king of France was there, he unclosed his eyes with a painful effort and said, Where is he? 
Sir, replied Louis, I am here, and am come to see how you are. I am going, said James quietly, to pay that debt which must be paid by all kings, as well as by their meanest subjects. I give your majesty my dying thanks for all your kindnesses to me and my afflicted family, and do not doubt of their continuance, having always found you good and generous. He also expressed his grateful sense of the attention he had been shown during his sickness. Louis replied, that it was a small matter indeed, but he had something to acquaint him with of more importance, on which the attendants of both kings began to retire. Let nobody withdraw, exclaimed Louis. Then turning again to James, he said, I am come, sir, to acquaint you that whenever it shall please God to call your majesty out of this world, I will take your family under my protection, and will recognize your son, the Prince of Wales, as the heir of your three realms. At these words, all present, both English and French, threw themselves at the feet of the powerful monarch, who was at that time the sole reliance of the destitute and sorrowful court at Saint-Germain. It was, perhaps, the proudest, as well as the happiest moment of Louis the Fourteenth's life, that he had dared to act in compliance with the dictates of his own heart, rather than with the advice of his more politic counsel. The scene was so moving that Louis himself could not refrain from mingling his tears with those which were shed by those around him. James feebly extended his arms to embrace his royal friend, and strove to speak, but the confused noise prevented his voice from being heard beyond these words. I thank God I die with a perfect resignation, and forgive all the world, particularly the Emperor and the Prince of Orange. He might have added, the Empress Eleanor Magdalene of Newburgh, whose personal pique at the preference which his matrimonial ambassador, the Earl of Peterborough, had shown for the beautiful Mary Beatrice of Modena, eight and twenty years before, although the means of elevating her to the greatest throne in Europe, was one of the unsuspected causes of the ill offices James, and afterwards his widow and son, experienced from that quarter. James begged, as a last favor, that no funeral pomp might be used at his obsequies. Louis replied, that this was the only favor that he could not grant. The dying king begged, that he would rather employ any money that he felt disposed to expend for that purpose, for the relief of his destitute followers. These he pathetically recommended to his compassionate care, with no less earnestness than he had done Mary Beatrice and her children. Having relieved his mind by making these requests, he begged his majesty not to remain any longer in so melancholy a place. The queen having meantime sent for the prince her son, brought him herself through the little bedchamber into that of his dying father, that he might return his thanks to his royal protector. The young prince threw himself at Louis's feet, and embracing his knees, expressed his grateful sense of his majesty's goodness. Louis raised and tenderly embraced him, promised to act the part of a parent to him. As this scene excited too much emotion in the sick, says the queen, we passed all three into my chamber, where the king of France talked to the young prince, my son. I wish much I could recollect the words, for never was any exhortation more instructive, more impressive, or fuller of wisdom and kindness. End of section 28「Section 29 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 9, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 8, Part 3. The Earl of Manchester, in his private report of these visits of Louis the Fourteenth to the sorrowful court of Saint-Germain, and his promises to the Queen and her dying husband, in behalf of their son, mentions the resignation of King James, and then speaking of the prince his son, says, I can tell you that the moment King James dies, the other will take the title of King of England, and will be crowned as such by those of Saint-Germain. The French king is now at Marley, and at his return he goes to Fontainebleau, so it may easily be contrived not to see the P, that is the prince, till his return. The queen will be in a convent at Chalot till the king be buried, and the P, or the prince, 
at the Duke of Lausun's at Paris, and after that they will return to Saint-Germain. I doubt not, but the French will call him Roy d'Angleterre. September 14th. It was expected that King James would have died last night, but he was alive this morning, though they expected he will expire every moment, being dead almost up to his stomach, and he is sensible of no pain. James retained, however, full possession of his mental faculties, and when his son entered his chamber, which was not often permitted, because it was considered to occasion too much emotion in his weak state, he stretched out his arms to embrace him and said, I have not seen you since his most Christian majesty was here, and promised to own you when I should be dead. I have sent Lord Middleton to Marley to thank him for it. The same day the Duke and Duchess of Burgundy came to take their last leave of him, when he spoke with composure to both, and begged that the Duchess would not approach the bed, fearing it might have an injurious effect on her health. We have been, writes the Earl of Manchester, September 16th, Ever since Tuesday, expecting to hear of the death of the late king, his greatest distemper is now a lethargy, and he is often thought dead, though with cordials they keep him up. The king of France was that day to see him, and there declared publicly that he would own the P, the prince, for king of England, and ordered the captains of the guards to pay him the same honors that they did to the late king James. The Duke of Berwick, who was an attendant on the deathbed of his royal father, James II, says that he remained in a lethargic state, except when roused by stimulants. His sight was weakened, but sense and consciousness remain with him unimpaired, to his last sigh. Never, continues Berwick, was there seen more patience, more tranquility, and even joy, than in the feelings with which he contemplated the approach of death and spoke of it. He took leave of the queen with extraordinary firmness, and the tears of this afflicted princess did not shake him, though he loved her tenderly. He told her to restrain her tears. Reflect, said he to her, that I am going to be happy and forever. Mary Beatrice told him that the nuns of Chalot were desirous that he should bequeath his heart to their community, to be placed in the same tribune with that of their royal foundress, Queen Henrietta, his mother and her own, when it may please God to shorten the term of their separation, by calling her hence. James thanked her for reminding him of it. He gave Mary Beatrice some directions about their son, and requested her to write to the Princess Anne, his daughter, when he should be no more, to assure her of his forgiveness, and to charge her on his blessing, to endeavor to atone to her brother for the injuries she had done him. Soon after, his hands began to shake with a convulsive motion, and the pangs of death came visibly upon him. His confessor and the bishop of Autun told the queen that she must withdraw, as they were about to offer up the services of their church for a departing soul, and that the sight of her agony would disturb the holy serenity which God had shed upon the heart of the king. She consented, as a matter of conscience, to tear herself away, but when she kissed his hands for the last time, her sobs and sighs roused the king from the lethargic stupor in which exhausted nature had sunk and troubled him. Why is this? said he tenderly to her. Are you not flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone? Are you not a part of myself? How is it then that one part of me should feel so differently from the other? I in joy and you in despair. My joy is in the hope I feel that God in his mercy will forgive me my sins and receive me into his beatitude, and you are afflicted at it. I have long sighed for this happy moment, and you know it well. Cease then to lament for me. I will pray for you. Farewell. This touching adieu took place four and twenty hours before James breathed his last. They forbade the queen to enter the chamber again, though he asked for her every time he awoke. Mary Beatrice, being informed of this, implored so passionately, the evening before his death, to be permitted to see him once more, promising not to allow anything to escape her that should have the effect of agitating him, that she was permitted to approach his bed. She struggled to feign a composure that she was far from feeling, but James, although his eyes were now waxed over and his ear dull, perceived the anguish of her soul, and when she asked him if he suffered, replied, I suffer, but it is only because I see how much you suffer. 
I should be well content if you were less afflicted, or could take some share in my happiness. She asked him to request of God for her the grace of love and perfect resignation to his will. They compelled her to withdraw, and she passed the awful interval in fasting, watching, and prayer alone in her chamber. When all was over, her confessor, Father Ruga, came to see her, no one else venturing to announce to her the fact that her husband had breathed his last. Even he shrank from the task of telling her so in direct words, but requesting her to unite with him in offering up some prayers for the king, he commenced with, Subvenite Sancte Dei. Oh, my God, is it then done? exclaimed the queen, throwing herself upon the ground, in an agony of grief, for she knew too well that this was part of the office appointed by their church, for a soul departed, and pouring out a torrent of tears, she remained long unable to utter a word. Father Ruga exhorted her to resign herself to the will of God, and in token of her submission to his decrees, to say, Fiat voluntas tua, thy will be done. Mary Beatrice made an effort to obey her spiritual director, but at first she could only give utterance to the word fiat. The blow, though it had so long impended over her, was hard to bear. For in spite of the evidences of her own senses to the contrary, she had continued to cherish a lingering hope that the separation might yet be delayed, and she scarcely knew how to realize the fact that it was irrevocable. As there never was a more perfect and more Christian union than that which subsisted between this king and queen, which for many years had been their mutual consolation, says a contemporary who was well acquainted with them both. So there was never a more bitter sorrow than was felt by her, though her resignation was entire and perfect. King James departed this life at three o'clock in the afternoon. He died with a smile on his countenance. The bitterness of death had long been past, and he had requested that his chamber door might be left without being guarded, so that all who wished to take a last look of him might freely enter. His apartments were crowded with both English and French, of all degrees, and his curtains were always open. The moment after he had breathed his last, says the Duke of Berwick, we all went to the Prince of Wales and saluted him as king. He was the same hour, proclaimed at the gates of the Chateau of Saint-Germain by the title of James the Third, King of England, Scotland, Ireland, and France. The Earl of Manchester affirms that there was no other ceremony than that the queen waited on him and treated him as king. What was done in town, continues his excellency, was done in a tumultuous manner. Some say there was a herald, an Irishman, Lord Middleton, etc., did not appear, because they could not tell how the title of France would be taken here, had they done it in form. Lord Middleton brought the seals to him, which he gave him again. Others did the like. I am told that, before the French king made this declaration, he held a council at Marley, where it took up some time to debate whether he should own him or no, or, if he did, whether it ought not to be deferred for some time. The secret of all this matter is that, in short, there was a person who governs here who had, some time since, promised the queen that it should be done, so that whatever passed in council was only for form's sake." When the royal widow came, in compliance with the ceremonial which their respective positions prescribed, to offer the homage of a subject to her boy, she said to him, Sir, I acknowledge you for my king, but I hope you will not forget that you are my son. And then, wholly overpowered by grief, she was carried in a chair from the apartment, and so conveyed to her coach, which was ready to take her to the convent at Chalot, where she desired to pass the first days of her widowhood in the deepest retirement, declaring that she would not receive the visits or the compliments of any person whatsoever. Mary Beatrice left Saint-Germain about an hour after her husband's death, attended by four ladies only, and arrived at Chalot a quarter before six, the conventual church of Chalot having, in the meantime, been hung with black by the nuns, and everything done requisite to testify their respect for the departed king and the royal widow of England, their afflicted friend and patroness, as soon as the tolling of the bells announced her approach. The abbess and all the community went in procession to receive her at the convent gate. The widowed queen descended from her coach in silence, with her hood drawn over her face, 
followed by her four noble attendants, and apparently overwhelmed with the violence of her grief. The nuns gathered round her in silence. No one offered to speak comfort to her, well knowing how tender had been the union that had subsisted between her and her deceased lord. The abbess kissed the hem of her robe. Some of the sisters knelt and embraced her knees, and others kissed her hand. But no one uttered a single word, leaving their tears to express how much they felt for her affliction. The tragedy of real life, unlike that of the stage, is generally a veiled feeling. The queen, says our authority, walked directly into the choir, without a sigh, a cry, or a word, like one who has lost every faculty but the power of motion. She remained in this mournful silence, this stupefaction of grief, till one of our sisters, it was the beloved Francoise Angelique Priolo, approached and kissed her hand, said to her in a tone of tender admonition, in the words of the royal psalmist, my soul, will you not be subject to God? Fiat voluntas tua, replied the sorrowful queen in a voice stifled with sighs. Then advancing toward the choir, she said in a firmer tone, Help me, my sisters, to thank my God for his mercies to that blessed spirit, who is, I believe, rejoicing in his beatitude. Yes, I feel certain of it in the depth of my grief. The abbess told her she was happy in having been the wife of such a holy prince. Yes, answered the queen, we have now a great saint in heaven. She then conducted into the choir, and all the sisters followed her. She prostrated herself before the altar, and remained long in prayer. Having eaten nothing since the night before, she was so weak, that the nuns, apprehending she would faint, begged her to be carried to her chamber in a chair. But out of humility, she chose to walk, after practicing many little fond observances, which appeared to have been edifying to the nuns, though the reader might be wearied, and perhaps offended by the detail. The abbesses and two or three of the nuns attended the poor queen to her chamber, and entreated her to suffer herself to be undressed and go to bed. But she insisted on listening to more prayers, and complained bitterly that the solace of tears was denied her. She could not weep now she who had wept so much during the prolonged agony of her husband's illness. She sighed often, says the nun, who has preserved the record of this mournful visit of the widow of James the Second to the convent of Chalot. Her sighs were so heavy and frequent that they pierced all our hearts with a share of those pangs that were rending her own. She was seized with fits of dying faintness from the feebleness and exhaustion of her frame, but she listened with great devotion to the abbess, who knelt at her feet, and read to her appropriate passages from the holy scriptures, for her consolation. Then she begged the community to offer up prayers for the soul of her husband, for, Oh, said she, a soul ought to be very pure, that has to appear in the presence of God, and we, alas, sometimes fancy that persons are in heaven, when they are suffering the pains of purgatory. And at this thought, the sealed-up fountain of her grief was opened, and she shed floods of tears. Much she wept, and much she prayed, but was at last prevailed on to take a little nourishment, and go to bed, while the nuns returned to the choir, and sang the vespers for the dead. Then the prayers for the dead were repeated in her chamber, in which she joined, repeating the verses of every psalm, for she knew them all by heart. She begged that a prayer for the conversion of England might be added for her sake, observing, for the last twelve years she had been at Saint-Germain, she had never omitted that petition at her private evening devotions. This little trait will be regarded as an instance of bigotry by many persons, but although Mary Beatrice, educated as she was in the strictest tenets of the Church of Rome, placed an undue importance on some things, which are not regarded by members of the Reformed Church as scriptural, her prayers being intended as acts of charity and Christian piety, and therefore ought not to be condemned. At seven in the evening, the queen sent for her almoner, and after she and her ladies had united in their domestic worship for the evening, she begged that the writer of this record, who was her particular friend, and another of the sisters of Chalot, would remain with her, for she saw that her ladies-in-waiting, and her femme de chambre, were worn out with fatigue and watching, and made them all go to bed. The nuns read to her from the Book of Wisdom, and the description of the New Jerusalem in the Apocalypse, 
the occupation of the blessed in that holy city, and several other passages from holy writ that were considered applicable to the time and circumstances. The queen listened, sometimes with sighs, and sometimes with elevation of the soul to God, and submission to his decrees. But her affliction was inconceivable, and would scarcely permit her to taste a few moments of repose. During the whole of the Saturday, she continued to pray and weep, and from time to time, related the particulars of the illness of the late king, her husband, and his patients. Never, said her majesty, did the illustrious sufferer give utterance to a word of complaint, nor make a gesture of impatience, although his pains were sharp, and lasted more than fifteen days. He accepted his sufferings as the punishment of his sins. He took all the remedies that were prescribed, however disagreeable they might be, observing that he was willing to live as long as it pleased God's providence to appoint, although he desired with ardor to die, that he might be united with Jesus Christ, without the fear of offending him any more. So entirely was my good king detached from earthly things, continued the royal widow, that notwithstanding the tenderness I have always had for him, and the love he bore to me, and the grief that I must ever feel for his loss during the rest of my days, I assure you that if I could recall his precious life by a single word, I would not pronounce it, for I believe it would be displeasing to God. After the royal widow had departed from Saint-Germain to Chalot, about six o'clock in the evening, the public were permitted to view the body of King James in the same chamber where he died. The clergy and monks prayed and chanted the dirge all night. Altars were erected in the chamber of death, where masses were said next morning until noon. When the body was opened for embalming, the heart and the brain were found in a very decayed state. James had desired on his deathbed to be simply interred in the church of Saint-Germain, opposite to the chateau, but when his will was opened, it was found that he had therein directed his body to be buried with his ancestors in Westminster Abbey. Therefore the queen resolved that his obsequies only should be solemnized in France, and that his body should remain unburied till the restoration of his son, which she fondly hoped would take place, and that, like the bones of Joseph in holy writ, the corpse of her royal husband would accompany his children when they returned to the land of their ancestors. The body was destined to await this expected event in the church of the Benedictines, Faubourg de Saint-Jacques, Paris, whither it was conveyed on the Saturday after his demise, about seven in the evening, in a morning carriage, followed by two coaches in which were the officers of the king's household, his chaplains, and the prior and curate of Saint-Germain. His guard carried torches of white wax around the cortege. The obsequies being duly performed in the convent church of the Benedictines, the body was left under the hearse, covered with the pall, in one of the chapels. So it remained during the long years that saw the hopes of the Stuart family wither, one after the other, till all were gone. Still the bones of James the Second remained unburied, awaiting sepulture. But, to return to Mary Beatrice, whom we left in her sorrowful retreat at Chalot, endeavoring to solace her grief by prayers and devotional exercises, which are termed, by the sister of that community by whom her proceedings have been recorded, acts of faith and acts of resignation. On the evening of Saturday, September 17th, the second day of her widowhood, Her Majesty, continues this sympathizing recluse, who had watched beside her on the preceding night, did me the honor of commanding me to take some repose, while Sister Catherine Angelique took my place near her. At the second hour after midnight, I returned to the queen. As soon as she saw me, she cried out, Ha! Huh, my sister, what have I suffered while you were away? It is scarcely possible to describe my feelings. I fell asleep for a few moments, but what a sleep it was! It seemed to me as if they were tearing out my heart and rending my bowels, and that I felt the most horrible pains. I made Her Majesty take some nourishment, and read to her the soliloquies in the manual of St. Augustine, and she slept again for a few moments. Then my sister, Catherine Angelique, told me that, during my absence, Her Majesty had done nothing but sigh, lament, and groan, and toss from one side of the bed to the other, and bemoan herself as if in the greatest pain. We, who had seen the queen so resigned in the midst of her affliction, were surprised at this extreme agitation, but, continues the simple nun, 
Our surprise ceased when they told us privately that the body of the late king had been opened and embalmed at the precise time that the queen was thus disquieted in her sleep. The same night they had conveyed his bowels to the English Benedictines and his heart to us, without any pomp or noise, as secretly as possible, for fear the queen should hear of it and be distressed. Our mother had received particular orders on that subject from our king, that is Louis the Fourteenth, prohibiting her from either tolling her bells or chanting at the reception of King James's heart within the convent of the visitation of Saint Marie de Chalot, lest it should agitate the royal widow. The young king of England, too, had expressly recommended us by my lord Perth to take every possible precaution to prevent the queen, his mother, from having the slightest idea of the time of its arrival, but the sympathy of the queen defeated all our precautions. The late king had good reason to say to his august spouse, that she was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. For when death had rendered his body insensible of the wound, the queen had felt all the pain in her own living frame, and this was the more to be remarked, since she knew nothing of what was then doing. The good sister of Chalot, being of a marvelous temperament, has made a miracle of a coincidence very easy to be accounted for, by natural causes. The poor queen has scarcely closed her eyes in sleep, for upwards of a fortnight, during which time she was in a state of most distressing excitement, while the occasional deceptive amendments in the king's symptoms, by kindling, the hope that keeps alive despair, had added the tortures of suspense to her other sufferings, and kept her nerves on a perpetual stretch. Every one knows the distressing sensations that attend the first perturbed slumbers into which exhausted nature sinks, after either nurse or patient has passed many nights of continuous vigils. Early on the Sunday morning, the queen asked many questions, which the nuns considered a confirmation of the presentiment she had had of the arrival of the heart of her departed lord. She said she knew that it was near her, and at last, they acknowledged that it was already enshrined in their tribune, near that of the queen his mother. She spoke much and eloquently that day of James. She said, that he had felt his humiliation, and above all, the injustice he had experienced very keenly, but that his love of God had changed all his calamities into blessings. She compared him to St. Stephen, who saw the heavens open while they were stoning him. While the queen was at Chalot, they read to her some passages from the life of the Reverend Mother, Anne-Marie d'Epernon, the superior of the great Carmelite convent at Paris, who had recently departed this life, with a great reputation for sanctity. Her majesty had been well acquainted with this religious, whom both the late king and herself had accustomed to visit and held in great esteem. Mary Beatrice appeared much interested in the records of her departed friend, who, before she took the habit, had refused the hand of the king of Poland, and preferred a life of religious retirement to being a queen. Ah, exclaimed the royal widow, she was right. No one can doubt the wisdom of the choice when we are at liberty to make it. Her majesty told the community that she had herself passionately desired to take the veil, and that it was only in compliance with her mother's commands that she had consented to marry her late lord. If it were not for the sake of her children, she said, she would now wish to finish her days at Chalot. Other duties awaited her. The King of France had commanded the exempt of the Guard of Honor, by whom Her Majesty was escorted to Chalot, and who remained on duty during her stay, not to admit any persons whatsoever to intrude upon her grief during her retirement there, not even the princesses of the blood, though Adelaide, Duchess of Burgundy, stood to her and King James in the near relation of great-niece. This order was so strictly obeyed, that even the Cardinal Noailles was refused admittance, though the queen had a great wish to see him. When his eminence was informed of this, he returned, and they had a long conference. On the third day after her arrival, being Monday, Mary Beatrice assumed the habit of a widow. And while they were thus arraying her, continues our good nun, her majesty, observing that I was trying to look through her eyes into her soul, to see what effect this dismal dress had on her mind, assured me, that these lugubrious trappings gave her no pain, because they were in unison with her own feelings, and that it would have been very distressing to her to have dressed otherwise, or indeed ever to change that dress. For the rest of my life, said Her Majesty, 
I shall never wear anything but black. I have long ago renounced all vanities, and worn nothing in the way of dress, but what was absolutely necessary, and God knows that I have not put on decorations, except in cases where I was compelled to do so, or in my early youth. When the melancholy toilet of Mary Beatrice was fully completed, and she was dressed for the first time in widow's weeds, she seated herself in a fautil, and all the ladies in the convent were permitted to enter, to offer her their homage and condolences. But every one was in tears, and not a word was spoken, for the queen sat silent and motionless as a statue, with her eyes fixed on vacancy, apparently too much absorbed in her own unspeakable grief, to be conscious of anything. I had the boldness, says our simple nun, to place the crucifix where her majesty's regards were absently directed, and soon all her attention was centered on that model of patience and suffering. After a quarter of an hour, I approached to give her an account of a commission with which she had charged me. She asked what hour it was. I told her that it was half past four o'clock, and her carriages were come, that the community were waiting in the gallery, and a chair and porters were in attendance to convey her to her coach. She rose and said, I have a visit to make before I go. Then bursting into a passion of tears, she cried, I will go and pay my duty to the heart of my good king. It is here, I feel that it is, and nothing shall stop me from going to it. It is a relic that I have given you, and I must be allowed to venerate it. The more enlightened tastes of the present age incline us to condemn as childish and superstitious this fond weakness of an impassioned lover, in thus clinging to a portion of the earthly tabernacle of the beloved, after his spirit had returned to God who gave it. But it was a characteristic trait, both of the times, the religion, and the enthusiastic temperament, of the countrywoman of Petrarch, of Ariosto, and Tasso. Everyone in the church of Saint-Marie de Chalot, at any rate, sympathized with her, and felt the tragic excitement of the scene, when the disconsolate widow of James the Second, in her sable weeds, covered with her large black veil, and preceded by the nuns singing the De Profundis, approached the tribune where the heart of her beloved consort was enshrined in a gold and vermeil vase. She bowed her head, clasped her hands together, knelt and kissed the urn across the black crepe that covered it, and after a silent prayer, rose, and having aspurged it with holy water, without a tear or sigh, turned about in silence to retire, apparently with great firmness, but before she made four steps from the spot, she fell into a fainting fit, which caused us, continues the recording nun, some fears for her life, when at last she recovered, she was, by the order of her confessor, placed in a chair, and so carried to her coach, it was impossible for her to stay longer at Chalot, because the young prince and princess, her children, had need of her presence at Germain. We have seen all this with our own eyes, observes the nun in conclusion. And the queen herself confirms what we have said here, as our mother and all the community judged it proper, that an exact and faithful narrative of the whole should be made, to the end that it might be kept as a perpetual memorial in our archives, and for those who may come after us. Mary Beatrice returned to her desolate palace at Saint-Germain on Monday, September 19th, in the evening, where the prince and princess rejoined her from Paris, and a tender reunion took place between the sorrowful family and their faithful adherents. The next day, Louis the Fourteenth came in state to pay his visits of condolence to the royal mother and son. The widowed queen received him in her darkened chamber, hung with black, lying on her bed of mourning, according to the custom of the French queens. Louis said everything he could to mitigate her affliction, and comforted her with the assurances of his protection to her and her son. William's ambassador, who kept a jealous eye on all the proceedings of the French sovereign, with regard to the widow of James the Second and her son, gives the following notices in his reports to his own court, which supply some authentic information touching this important epoch. On the 24th of September, he says, I did not go to Versailles yesterday. I was satisfied that the whole discourse would be of their new Roy d'Angleterre, and of the king's going to make him the first visit at Saint-Germain, which he did that day. He stayed but little with him, giving him the title of majesty. 
he was with the queen a considerable time. The rest of the court made their compliments the same day. September 23rd, the French king made the P, the prince, the first visit. The next day, the P, or prince, returned the visit at Versailles. All the ceremonies passed to the entire satisfaction of those at Saint-Germain, and in the same manner as it was observed with the late king. September 24th, I can perceive from Monsieur de Torcy that the French king was brought to do this at the solicitation of the queen at Saint-Germain. It is certain that Monsieur de Torcy, as well as the rest of the ministers, was against it, and only the Dauphin and Madame de Maintenon, whom the queen had prevailed with, carried this point, which I am satisfied they may have reason to repent of. September 26th. The will of the late King James is opened, but not yet published, but I hear it is to be printed. What I have learned of it is, that the Queen is made regent. The French King is desired to take the care of the education of the P, or Prince. That in case he be restored, the Queen is to be repaid all that she has laid out of her own. That all other debts which they had contracted, since they left England, and what can be made out, shall be paid that the new king shall not take any revenge against his father's enemies, nor his own, that he shall not use any forces in matters of religion, or in relation to the estates of any persons whatsoever. He recommends to him all those that have followed him. I am told that Lord Perth is declared a duke, and Carl a lord. The information touching the will of King James was true, as far as regards the power given to Mary Beatrice, but this document was dated as far back as November 17, 1688, having been made by him after the landing of the Prince of Orange, when he was on the eve of leaving London to join the army at Salisbury. By that document, he bequeaths his soul to God, in the confident assurance of eternal salvation, through the merits and intercession of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, without a word of the Virgin Mary, or any other saint. Our body, he says, we commit to the earth, and it is our will that the same be privately interred in our royal chapel, called Henry the Seventh's Chapel. After mentioning the settlements which he had made, first as Duke of York, out of his personal property, and afterwards when king, as a provision for his entirely beloved consort, Queen Mary, he constitutes his dear son, Prince James, his sole heir, both of his three kingdoms and his personal property, with the exception of certain jewels, plate, household furniture, equipages, and horses, which are left to the royal widow. And we will and appoint that our said dearest consort, continues his majesty, have the sole governance, tuition, and guardianship of our said dear son, till he shall have fully completed the fourteenth year of his age. It is a curious fact, that James, after thus constituting Mary Beatrice as the guardian of their son and executrix of his last will and testament, appoints a council to assist her in this high and responsible charge, composed of the persons in whom he, at that date, reposed the most especial trust and confidence, and at the head of this list stood uncancelled the name of his son-in-law, Prince George of Denmark, the Duke of Newcastle, the Earl of Nottingham, the Duke of Queensbury, Cromwell's son-in-law, Viscount Falkenberg, and Lord Godolphin, are there, united with the names of some of the most devoted of James's friends, who, with their families, followed him into exile, the true-hearted Earl of Lindsay, the Marquis of Powys, the Earls of Perth and Middleton, and Sir Thomas Strickland, besides several of those who played a doubtful part in their struggle, and others, both friend and foe, who had gone to their great account, before the weary spirit of the last of the Stuart kings was released from its earthly troubles. In virtue of this will, the only one ever made by James the Second, Mary Beatrice was recognized by the court and council of her deceased lord at Saint-Germain as the acting guardian of the prince their son, and took upon herself the title of Queen Regent of Great Britain. She was treated by Louis the Fourteenth and his ministers, with the same state and ceremony as if she had been invested with this office in the only legal way by the Parliament of this realm. End of section 29。section 30 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 9, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland。
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Beatrice of Modena, Chapter 8, Part 4. The first care of the widowed queen was to obey the deathbed injunctions of her deceased consort by writing to his daughter, the Princess Anne of Denmark, to communicate his last paternal message and admonition. It was a painful duty to Mary Beatrice, perhaps the most painful to her high spirit and sensitive feelings that had ever been imposed upon her, to smother her indignant sense of the filial crimes that had been committed by Anne against her fond, confiding king and father, the slander she had assisted in disseminating against herself, and above all, the base aspersions that princess had endeavored to cast on the birth of the prince her brother for the purpose of supplanting him in the succession to the throne of the britannic empire mary beatrice had too little of the politician too much of the sensitive feelings of the female heart in her character to make deceitful professions of affection to the unnatural daughter of her heartbroken husband her letter is temperate, but cold and dignified, and though she does not condescend to the language of reproachful accusation, it clearly implies the fact that she regarded Anne in the light of a criminal, who, without effective repentance and the fruits of penance, sincere efforts to repair her offenses against her earthly parent, must stand condemned in the sight of her heavenly father. Letter of Mary Beatrice of Modena to the Princess Anne of Denmark I think myself indispensably obliged to defer no longer the acquainting you with a message which the best of men, as well as the best of fathers, has left with me for you. Some few days before his death, he bid me find means to let you know that he forgave you from the bottom of his heart, and prayed God to do so too, that he gave you his last blessing, and prayed to God to convert your heart, and confirm you in the resolution of repairing to his son, the wrongs done to himself, to which I shall only add, that I join my prayers to his, herein with all my heart, and that I shall make it my business to inspire into the young man who is left to my care, the sentiments of his father, for better no man can have. September 27th, 1701 if Mary Beatrice expected any good effects to be produced by the stern sincerity of such a letter, she knew little of the human heart, to which nothing is so displeasing as the prayers of another for its amendment. A few days after the date of this letter, Mary Beatrice completed her forty-third year. The anniversary of her birth had always been kept as a feat by the exile court at Saint-Germain, but this year, in consequence of the melancholy bereavement she had so recently sustained, it was observed by her in a different manner. She gives the following account of herself in her first letter to the superior of Chalot on her return to Saint-Germain. It is dated October 6th, just three weeks after the death of King James. My health, she says, is good beyond what I ever could have hoped in the state in which I find myself, for I avow frankly that my heart and my soul are sad, even unto death, and that every passing day, instead of diminishing, appears to augment my grief. I feel more and more the privation and the separation from him who was dearer to me than my own life, and who alone rendered that life sweet and supportable. I miss him every day, more and more, in a thousand ways. In my first grief, I felt something like a calm beneath, but now, although, perhaps, it does not appear so much outwardly, I feel a deeper sorrow within me. Yesterday, the day of my birth, I made a day of retreat, that is, spiritual retirement for self-recollection and religious exercises. But with so much pain and weariness and tedium, that, so far from finding it a solace, I was oppressed and crushed down with it, as I am also with the weight of business, so much so that in truth my condition is worthy of compassion. I hope the God of mercy will have pity on me, and come to my help, but here I feel it not nor is it permitted me to find comfort either on earth or heaven. The royal widow then goes on to express her ardent wish of making another visit to Chalot to keep the festival of all saints with her cloistered friends there, and her fears that, overwhelmed with business and anxiety as she was at this period, it would not be permitted to her to follow the bent of her own inclination. Never, she says in conclusion, 
never had any one so great a want of prayers as i have i entreat of god to hear those which you make to him for me and that he will deign to pity and take care of me mary beatrice was now a widow without a dower a regent without a realm and a mother whose claims to that maternity which had deprived herself and her husband of a throne were treated by a strong party of her former subjects with derision although the subsequent birth of the princess louisa had sufficiently verified that of her son rendering withal the absurdity manifest of the widowed queen upholding the claims of an alien to her blood to the prejudice of her own daughter who might otherwise expect to be recalled to england as the next in the royal succession to the princess anne of denmark there were indeed those burnett for instance who talked of a second imposition in the person of the young louisa but the striking likeness between the royal brother and sister sufficiently indicated that their parentage was the same mary beatrice gives the following brief account of their health and her own together with a touching allusion to her departed husband in a letter to the abbess of chalot at the commencement of a sorrowful new year dated saint germain january fourth seventeen o two my health is good and that of the king my son and my daughter perfect god be thanked i have bad nights myself but that does not prevent me from going on as usual every day i have great want of courage and of consolation god can grant me these when it pleases him i hope that your prayers will obtain them for me join with those of that blessed spirit whose separation from mine is the cause of all my pain the first step taken by mary beatrice in the capacity of guardian to the prince her son was to publish a manifesto in his name setting forth his claims to the crown of great britain as the natural heir of the deceased king his father this manifesto produced no visible effects in favour of the young prince in england in scotland the party that was secretly opposed to william's government and openly to his favourite project of the union of the two realms perceived how powerful an instrument might be made of the youthful representative of the royal stuarts if they could succeed in bringing him forward as a personal actor in the political arena the duke of hamilton and the confederate lords having organized their plans for a general rising sent the earl of belhaven on a secret mission to saint germain to communicate their design to the queen mother and to endeavor to prevail on her to entrust them with her son from a very curious contemporary document in the lately discovered portfolio in the bibliothèque du roy it appears that in november seventeen o one the earl of belhaven came to paris on this errand where he remained three months he had several conferences with the earl of middleton to whom he was introduced by his brother-in-law captain john livingston lord belhaven was naturally regarded at first with feelings of distrust by the exiled queen and her cabinet having been one of the most subtle of all the instruments employed by william in bringing about the revolution of sixteen eighty eight he succeeded however in removing the unpleasant impression created by his former political conduct by professing the most determined hostility against the dutch sovereign who instead of paying the debt of gratitude with the rewards and honors to which he conceived that his extraordinary services entitled him had neglected and slighted him and performed none of his pledges with regard to scotland i remember says our authority that my lord belhaven said that he had sent letters to the duke of hamilton and that he acted by his instructions the duke having become the head of those who were faithful to the interests of their country that he had himself been hated and ill-treated by king william and that he had now an aversion to the cause of a prince who had so greatly deceived the nation that the yoke which bound scotland to england for he could not call it a union had been the ruin of his country that he for one was for setting up the claims of the prince of wales in so decided a manner as to compel the reigning king to acknowledge him and that would keep him in check and make him pay more attention to the interests of the ancient realm of his ancestors on the second of february seventeen o two his lordship had a private audience of the queen in her palace of st germain to whom he repeated all he had said to the earl of middleton of the favourable intentions of his party in behalf of her son he told her 
that if the prince could be induced to embrace the protestant religion it would be easy to obtain his recall even by the parliament as the recognized successor of king william he represented to her how desirable this would be for said he england is so superior in force to scotland both by sea and land that unless he had a strong party in england he would not as king of scotland be able to conquer england the prince of wales continued he has not only a strong party in england but a bond of alliance in france to support him in his claims mary beatrice was inexorable on the subject of religion even when lord belhaven went on to assure her that if her son would declare himself a protestant the duke of hamilton and his party would proclaim him king of scotland without waiting either for the death of william or the consent of the english parliament her majesty with uncompromising sincerity replied that she would never be the means of persuading her son to barter his hopes of heaven for a crown neither could she believe that any reliance could be placed by others on the promises of a prince who was willing to make such a sacrifice to his worldly interests lord belhaven after expressing his extreme regret at her stiffness on this important point next proposed to her majesty on the part of the duke of hamilton and the confederate scottish lords that if the prince would not change his religion he would at least make a compact not to suffer more than a limited number of romish priests in his kingdom and that he would make no attempt to alter the established religion in either realm this the queen freely promised for the prince her son and then his lordship engaged in the name of his party that he would do all in their power to oppose the english parliament in the act of settlement regarding the hanoverian succession it is interesting to be able to unveil some of the secret feelings that had agitated the heart of the royal mother in anticipation of this important interview in a letter to her friend the abbess of chalot dated february first she says i am ashamed to tell you that for several days past i have slept less and wept more than i have done for some time i find myself utterly overwhelmed without power to find consolation either in heaven or earth i hope always that my dear sainted king will by his intercessions obtain help for me of god i expect it perhaps too eagerly for my need of it is very great she goes on to speak of the publication of some of king james's letters and of the funeral oration that had been made for him in the pope's chapel at rome where her kinsman cardinal barberini chanted the mass and the pope himself sang the libera my health continues she thanks to god is wonderfully good and i beg of him to give me grace to employ all his gifts for his sole service in conclusion she says and this has clearly reference to the propositions about to be made to her by the confederate scotch lords through lord belhaven i request some particular prayers to obtain the enlightenment and blessing of god on the business which we have at present on the tapas and when it is put home to me is likely to augment my troubles this is to yourself alone lord belhaven had several interviews with the queen to whom he continued unavailingly to urge the desirableness of the prince conforming to the prevailing religion of the realm over which she flattered herself he might one day reign the queen declared that her son young as he was would rather die than give up his religion but that neither he nor the late king his father or herself entertained any designs to the prejudice of the church of england all they desired was toleration for those of their own way of thinking which she said with some emotion she considered was only reasonable finally lord belhaven communicated the earnest desire of the duke of hamilton and his party that she should send the prince to scotland in which case they were willing to raise his standard and rally their followers at present his name was all that was known of him but if he were once seen among them he would be recognized as the representative of their ancient sovereigns and the people would be ready to fight in his cause unfortunately the maternal weakness of mary beatrice was of too absorbing a nature to allow her to entertain this proposition perhaps she doubted the principles of lord belhaven whom she had little reason to esteem 
it has been conjectured that she apprehended that the duke of hamilton meant to revive the never forgotten claims of his own ancestors on the scottish crown nothing could induce her to put her son into the hands of the confederate lords he was a minor she said and as his guardian she stood responsible to the late king his father and also to the people of england who would she doubted not one day recall him to the throne of his forefathers but in the interim she would not consent to his incurring so great a peril on her own responsibility she had been persuaded that it was the intention of the party that had placed the prince of orange on the throne to assassinate her boy at the time she fled with him from england thirteen years before and this idea returned so forcibly to her mind on the present occasion that she could not conceal her uneasiness when the proposition was made to her and thus an opportunity that seemed to promise much was lost for she preferred the personal safety of her son to the advancement of his interests mary beatrice gave much of her confidence at this period to lord carroll who had been her secretary when duchess of york had followed her into exile and sacrificed all his property in england for the sake of his principles she had induced king james to advance him to the post of secretary of state being well persuaded of his fidelity he was a person of a very elegant mind and had been the friend and earliest patron of pope it was to the suggestions of carol that pope was indebted for the idea of the unique and graceful poem of the rape of the lock he was also the friend and assistant of dryden his talents as a statesman were not equal to the difficulties of his position at the court of st germain where he was crossed by the intrigues and jealousies of weak violent and wrong-headed rivals the queen esteemed and trusted him and that was sufficient to entail upon him the envy and ill-will of the rest of the cabinet who charged all the miscarriages of the jacobite cause to his influence it is strange that among persons who had sacrificed everything for their principles so much disunion should exist especially in a court without an exchequer where all service was performed con amore lord middleton professed to be a protestant but in his hours of relaxation declared he believed in no religion his fidelity to james the second was greatly doubted that king on his deathbed entreated him to heed his ways and to be converted after the death of his royal master he fell into disgrace with the queen he regained her confidence in the following manner he had been ill some time or affected to be so one morning in great agitation he demanded audience of the queen at st germain and when she granted it he told her that by a miracle his health was perfectly restored he had seen a vision of his lost master king james in the night who told him he would get well but that he owed his health to his prayers and that he must become a catholic middleton concluded this scene by declaring his conversion this was attacking the poor widow of james on a weak point of her character she burst into tears of joy and received middleton into her confidence he abjured the protestant faith took the catholic sacraments immediately and soon after ruled all at st germain the news of this conversion was communicated by mary beatrice to her friend angelique priolo in terms which though they may elicit a smile from persons of a calmer and more reflective turn of mind were perfectly consistent with the enthusiastic temperament of her own i defer not a moment my dear mother to send you the good news of the conversion of my lord middleton which i have known for several days but it was not in my power till yesterday to declare that to you which has given me such great pleasure the only one in truth of which i have been sensible since the death of our sainted king to whose intercession i cannot but attribute this miracle the greatest in my opinion that we have seen in our day entreat our mother that is the abbess of chalot and all our sisters from me to assist me in returning thanks to god and in praying to him for a continuance of his grace and his mercies which are admirable and infinite i will tell you the particulars of this when we meet but at present you must be content with learning that he has left us at seven o'clock yesterday morning to go to paris and to put himself in the hands of the superior of the english seminary there who is a holy man for some weeks i am about to send this news to madame de maintenon 
but I hope to see her tomorrow, or the day after, at saint Let us confess that God is good, my dear mother, and that he is true, that his mercies are above all, and through all his works, that he ought to be blessed for ever. Amen. At the time of King James's death, Mary Beatrice was in arrears to the convent of Chalot, a large sum, for the annual rent of the apartments that were retained for her use, and that of her ladies and her attendants. The money she would have fain appropriated to the liquidation of this debt by installments was constantly wrung from her by the craving misery of the starving families of the devoted friends who had given up everything for the sake of their old master, King James, and she knew that their necessities were more imperative than the claims of the compassionate nuns who were willing to wait her convenience occasionally she had it in her power to gratify them with gifts from the poor remnants of her former splendor for the decoration of their church their gratitude on one of these occasions when they addressed a letter of thanks to her signed by the superior and all the sisterhood appeared to her sensitive delicacy so much more than was her due that she addressed the following affectionate letter of reproof to her beloved friend angelique priolo on this subject it is like too many of hers without date is it possible my dear mother that all your good sense and the friendship you bear me should not have led you to prevent all the things from our mother and the rest of the community for so trifling a thing and have spared me this shame i expect that of you instead of which you have seriously put your name among the others to augment my confusion you know my heart my dear mother and the desire i have to do much for you and others to whom i owe much and the pain i feel at doing so little in truth my poverty is never more keenly felt by me than when i think of chalot and if i ever become rich assuredly you will all be the first to feel it her majesty laments that it will be a month before she can see her friend again in the meantime she says i send my children to you it is my daughter who will give you this letter say something to her for her good and give her some instruction oh how happy i should esteem myself if i could put her into the hands of a person who has your good qualities beg of god to inspire me with what i ought to do for the benefit of this dear daughter End of section 30. End of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 9, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland.